morning all we'd like to welcome all those to the services both in person and by other means if you would please open your song books number 303 number 303 we'll have this song before our scripture reading and prayer number 303 just over in the glory land <clears throat> I've a home prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory. Scripture reading will come from Psalms 118. 118, read the entire chapter. <clears throat> oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endures forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say, that his mercy endures forever. I called upon the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. 
It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations can pass me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They can pass me about, yea, they can pass me about, but, it's, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They can pass me about like bees. They are quenched as fire, fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doth valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over to, unto death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go in into them, and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the head stone of the corner. This is the Lord's doings. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice in it and be glad. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send thy prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which hath shown us light. Bind the sacrifice to a cord, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, and I will exalt thee. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for mercy endures forever. Let us bow I will pray. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful that we can assemble here this morning to worship thee. And Father, we thank you for your son for the word that we have to study and we pray father that we will always use thy word and that we will worship thee in in the manner that is set forth in thy word that we worship in spirit and in truth father we ask thee to forgive us of our sins as we know that we do sin and come short of many times in this world doing things we shouldn't or saying things that we shouldn't. We pray, Father, that you forgive us of those things that we can be acceptable in thy sight this morning. Father, we're thankful for the worship that we can participate in, the singing, the praying, the Lord's Supper, the giving and studying thy word. We pray that we do all of these things, these acts, according to thy will. And Father, we know there's several sick. We pray that you would bless them. Bless their, their return to their health, that they can be back in their place again and be back in worship with us. And those around about the world, Father, who have lost all their belongings and we, in the storms, we pray for them and we pray that their needs can be met at this time. Father, we pray that that will continue to give us good health. These things that we take for granted, we ask thee to bless us with the health that we need from day to day and we ask that all of these things be done according to thy will in jesus name i pray amen song we'll sing before we have the opportunity to partake of the lord's supper we'll sing number 387 number 387 we'll sing all three verses uh, glory to his name <clears throat> Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin.
we as Christians are commanded to participate on the upon the Lord's Supper the first of every week, let us give thanks for this opportunity. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread which represents Christ's body broken on the cross. As we partake of it, help us take our minds back to the cross and his sacrifice. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray again. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cup, the fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood shed on the cross. Let us, let us partake in a, well, in a way that's well pleasing unto, unto thee. In Christ, we pray. Amen. Likewise, we're also commanded to give of our means of the first day of the week so that the Lord's work may abound. Um, if before, we sing, before we are able to do so, we'll sing the first verse of number 383. Number 383, off we come together. <clears throat> off we come together, off we sing and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the material blessings you, you bless us with. As we give back, help us to do so with a cheerful heart. In Christ we pray. Amen. If you'd like to mark your song books to the Song of Invitation, following the lesson will be number 706, number 706, Why Do You Wait? After you got that marked, if you'd open your song books to number 702, number 702, Trust and Obey, we'll sing the song before the lesson. If you'd like to, please stand. <clears throat> <clears throat> when we walk with the Lord in the light of Is it? 
It was Tuesday on the final week before the crucifixion of Jesus. And a scribe came to Jesus. A scribe kept the public records. He wrote or transcribed the law. And he was one of the recognized teachers and interpreters of the law. The scribes were skilled in the law of Moses. They examined its difficult and intricate questions. They were among the number, though, who added to God's commandments laws and requirements which God never added. And according to Matthew 15, 1 to 9, they made God's law void. But in Matthew 22, 34 to 40, and with the parallel in Mark 12, 28 to 34, today I want to talk about a question for Jesus when we think about being not far from the kingdom. In Matthew 22, 35, Matthew says this man was a lawyer, an expert in the Mosaic law. But notice verse 35 says he was trying Jesus, testing Jesus. Now it's one thing to ask a question to, it, to elicit truth or information. But it's another thing to ask someone a question to entrap them. 
And that shows and goes to the motive of the question and the mindset of the questioner. He asked Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? Or which is the great commandment in the law? This question was a worthy question. And any time anyone asked a Bible question of Jesus, it was a welcomed question. So Jesus was happy to answer it. But it's also notice, or interesting to notice, why the scribe asked Jesus the question. Verse 28 says that he had been impressed with the answers that Jesus was giving to the questions that were being asked him. And he'd been listening to this. And I believe this is a wake up for those of us who preach and teach. We never know who's listening to our teaching. We never know the impression of us that they are getting when we teach. And so we must be very careful that in teaching the Word of God we are prepared, that we use the proper spirit, that we give the very best presentation of which we are capable in order that people may have an open door of a study of the Word of God. So we ask a very welcome question. And Jesus answered the question from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. It's interesting that Deuteronomy 6 is one of the chapters Jesus used to ask or to answer the devil in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. So he takes the scribe to his Bible. <coughs> Jesus' answer was an immediate answer. He gave it right back to him. It was an inclusive answer. It included a number of things that this young man needed to consider. And it was an instructive answer because he's teaching this young man an application of the law. It's interesting that Christ answered the scribe's question with a scriptural quotation. We might say that Christ gave a Bible answer to a Bible question. It's significant, isn't it? Jesus is divine. He could have answered of himself, and yet he chose to take this young man to his Bible. And he said to him, in, in essence, open your Bible. And there can be no improvement on that method. When people ask us a Bible question, ladies and gentlemen, we need to give them a Bible answer. Here's what God's Word says. Notice when you go to Deuteronomy 6 and you look at the passage that is under consideration, verses 4 and 5, that Jesus began his answer with God. And this is the proper beginning place for study. Without the proper knowledge of God, we cannot know ourselves, nor can we know others. Hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God is one Jehovah. Notice in beginning with God, he stressed, first of all, the unity of God. Jehovah, our God, is one Jehovah. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Now in the law, this is called the Shema. It comes out S-H-E-M-A in English. And it's a statement of faith that was recited every day by an Orthodox Jew. So this verse was well known to this scribe, and it was well known to others who would have been standing around listening. The Hebrew word shema comes from a word which means to hear. 
So you'll see the passage in Deuteronomy 6 begins, Hear, O Israel, Shema, O Israel, the Lord our Jehovah our God is one Jehovah. So he begins with God, and he stresses the unity of God. Second, he stressed love for God. Matthew 22, 37. You shall love the Lord your God. We cannot love the unknown. We must have a clear conception of God in order to love him as directed here. What conception do I have of God? See, it's more than just knowing the Bible says something, but what is the conception that is there, and what conception do I have? How do you think of God? How do you picture God? I studied with a man in a federal penitentiary who could not call God Father because of the horrible image he had of his own earthly father. So our ability to understand God and our ability to answer this question, the greatest question of all, or the greatest commandment of all, what is it? It begins with a right conception of God, the unity of God, and then being able to love God. And notice he said, you shall love the Lord your God with A-L-L. -L. Now that does not leave any room for intrusion from something else. It cannot be shared. It is not a partial thing. You must love Jehovah your God with all your heart. And the Greek word cardia came to stand for man's mental and moral activity, his rational and emotional elements of thinking. In other words, the heart is used figuratively for the hidden springs of personal life, one writer said. It is our duty to love God with all the heart, our intellect, our will, our emotion. Our love for God cannot be a formal love. It cannot be a cool love. It cannot be, I love God, but I love me. I love me more than I love God. I must love God more than anything. My love must be full for God. It must be entire for God. It must be absolute for God. I must love Jehovah my God with all my soul. The Greek word psuche here is used to indicate the seat of the will and the purpose. So I must love God with what my thinking is. I want to love God. I will to love God. And I want to love Him, and I love Him with all my will, with all my purpose. And I must love Jehovah my God with all my mind. The word mind here comes from a Greek word, denoia, and it means a thinking through or a thinking over or a meditation, a reflecting. I must love God with my thinking through things. It means more than just intellectually apprehending God. But it means willingness to have my will changed into his will. Flat on his face, three times in the garden, Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. So he stressed the unity of God. He stressed love for God. Number three, he stressed a relationship with God. You shall love Jehovah your God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, but he must be your God. If he's not your God, nothing else matters. 
If he's not your God, you can't love him with all your heart and soul and mind. He must be your God, not the preacher's God, not your husband's God or your wife's God, not your mom and daddy's God. He must be your God. You must have entered into a personal relationship with him through your obedience to the gospel plan of salvation. So when I hear the gospel and I come to recognize the fact state that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I believe that, John 8, 24, I'm taking a step into a relationship with God to make him my God. When I realize I cannot live in sin on purpose and please God and be in the right relationship with God, I change my mind about doing that. I don't want to live like that anymore, and I want on purpose so I repent Acts 1730 when I realize that he is going to be my God I want everybody to know that and so I'm ready to confess I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God Acts 837 and then to enter into that relationship with him to be baptized into Christ so his blood can send my sins away Acts 238 so I can be raised cleansed saved in that proper relationship with him in the relationship with the Father and the Son the Holy Spirit Matthew 28 18 to 20 but he must be my God what is the greatest commandment of all you individually shall love an action that must be taken the Lord a person to whom that action must be directed your God a relationship into which you have entered that allows you to take the action necessary to love him with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind. What's the greatest commandment of all? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But he has to be your God. But Jesus didn't stop there. Jesus had given him a biblical answer. He could have stopped there. But Jesus gave additional information to this lawyer he said to him, and he's quoting now from Leviticus 19:19, 19, 19, and he called this a second commandment that is like. It's the same nature. It's of the same condition as the first. And what he's saying is this second commandment and this first commandment are on equal footing. So if you love Jehovah your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, then you must love your neighbor as yourself. Notice he had stressed love for God. Now he stresses outward love as we love our neighbors. The term for neighbor here has a very comprehensive scope. It touches people that's in a wide circle. It's not just the person next door. And in Luke 10, 25 to 37, when one would ask, who is my neighbor? Jesus illustrated the neighbor idea with a man who saw someone in need, ministered to that need, visited that need, and took care of it. And he asked this young man, and then who was neighbor to him? And he said, the man who showed him mercy. So it's everyone with whom we <clears throat> come in contact but notice outward love you must love your neighbor but then he stressed inward love as simile as you love yourself I do not know how to love my neighbor until I know how to love me properly in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3 I get an insight into how to love me. I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly, more highly than he ought to think, circle it, but 
So don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Think seriously about yourself as you really are. Don't elevate yourself to somewhere you're not. In English, we call that stuck on themselves. Stuck up, arrogant, haughty. Someone who thinks that they are better than everyone else. And you see that illustrated in the 18th chapter of Luke with the Pharisee who said, God, I thank you I'm not as other men, especially this tax collector. I'm much better than they. Paul said, don't think of yourself that way. In Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 28, Paul would say, husbands ought to love their own wives. Notice the simile. As their own bodies, the comparison there. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined or cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife, look at it, as himself twice. And let the wife see that she reverence or respects her husband. How do you love your wife? You love your wife as you love yourself. How do you love yourself? You take care of yourself. You nourish. You cherish yourself. So what would you do with your wife? You would nourish and cherish her. Well, if you love your neighbor like you love yourself, what would you do? You would nourish and cherish and take care of your neighbor. That's a far cry, isn't it, from the world in which you and I live that is so inward turned that says it's me and mine. And that's all with which I'm concerned. Jesus said you're to love your neighbor as you love yourself. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul said, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not out for his own interest only, but also for the interests of others. How concerned am I, am, am I with you? How concerned are you with me? We call that consideration. We call that taking into account the needs of the other person. Ladies and gentlemen, if people in the church need anything, it's that. I want you to just observe yourself when the service is dismissed. Do you go talk to other people? Do you welcome visitors? Or do you get in your clique? How interested are we in the folks outside of us, outside of our group, outside of our circle? Do I have an outward antenna that is looking for the interest of others? Jesus said to this man, your Bible teaches you to love God supremely and to love yourself sincerely as you love your neighbor. And Jesus stated that these two commandments form the basis of all the law and the prophets. So if you want to understand the law and the prophets, understand Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Understand the principles that were given to Israel as they were to look at the strangers at the gate. They were to look at the foreigners that sojourned among them and how they were to treat them and behave toward them so that they might see the light of God, turn from idolatry, and come to serve God only. In Mark 12 and 31, he said, There's no other commandment greater than these. The whole law hung on that like a hinge, like you would hang something on a nail. The law and the prophets hung on love God supremely, love your neighbor sincerely as you love yourself. 
the answer that Jesus gave impress the scribe. In Mark's account, in Mark 12, 32 to 34, you see that Christ answered the question in the same spirit in which it was asked. There's a good little side note for us as we talk with people and we answer their Bible questions. If they're sincere, we need to be sincere in our answers. Answer them in the spirit in which the question is asked. And in Mark 12, 32 and 33, the scribe complimented the answer of Jesus as being biblically true. So among other things about the scribe, though his motive was wrong, ethically he was out of bounds when he came to try or test Jesus. But he was honest with what the Bible said. And he said, you have answered correctly. And then in verse 34, Jesus commended the scribe with the statement that is forming the basis for this study. When he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Maybe today you're like this scribe. Maybe you're like the scribe in the fact that you understand what the Bible teaches. You know that it says you must love God with everything. You know that it says he must be my everything. He must be my all. You understand that. You know that's biblical. That's not somebody trying to pull something theological over on you. That's biblical. And you will admit, I know that's what the Bible teaches. But you haven't acted on it. You may be like this scribe. You're not in the kingdom, but you're not far from it. If you're willing to respond to what you already know. If you're willing to allow your Bible knowledge to motivate the way you act. The way you behave. You see, there's more to being a Christian than just sitting on these pews three times a week if you do that. It's really what we do when we go out the door. It's what we are when we interact with people. Can they see us loving God supremely? Can they see us loving them as we love ourselves? You want to open a door for Christianity? It's by your lifestyle. It's by letting this permeate up here, get into our hearts, and then be seen in the way we live. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely point the way. For I may misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. Are you far from the kingdom? Through gospel obedience, you can become a member of the kingdom. We want to help you while we stand and encourage. Wow. 
Let's have our closing prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day and all the many blessings of life. We're thankful for the lesson we have just heard. We thank thee for Christ who came down and died on the cross for us. We would ask that thou be with the sick of this congregation, be with those that have lost loved ones, and bring us back here at our next point in time tonight. All these blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen.